Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfi. If you enjoy this programming, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Join Truth and Rhythm's membership program through Patreon. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkandstuff.net. At that site, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership singer-songwriter Liv Warfield, best known for her 2009 to 2015 association with Prince and his new power generation band. She can be heard on several Prince projects along with some associate acts and spent several years performing as part of the MPG. In addition, Prince executive produced her second solo album called The Unexpected. Also a member of the group Broadcast Royale with Hearts Nancy Wilson, Warfield's powerful, soulful, and rocking stylings have additionally graced TV and film. Her shows continue to thrill audiences, and her third solo album, titled Olivia, is due out this year. Liv, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you good. so much for Thank joining us. Thank you for us. having me. Thank you so much <laughs> for having me on. Uh, my pleasure. Been looking forward to it. Thank you. We got and there. <laughs> Yeah, we made it happen, man. <laughs> yeah, third time's a charm. We won't yes, get into yes, that, but yes, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, where are you today, Liv? I'm home in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I'm born and raised in Peoria, Illinois, but I'm back home. I've been back home for about five years now, and uh, I love it. At first, I was like, mm, I don't know, but I, <laughs> I actually really enjoy the energy being closer to the family and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. You know, I've never been there, but uh, uh -huh. what I know it best for, I think, isn't Richard Pryor from there? Oh yes. That's my family. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's from there. And then, um, well, it's uh, Hershey Hawkins, I believe. Peoria has got a lot. Peoria is really, I think, known for the athletics. Like we have a really big um, athletic community. A lot of basketball comes out of Peoria that I know for sure. So okay. I wasn't that one, but <laughs> where where's in relation to Chicago, just so people have a good idea. It's this it's two hours south, about two and a half hours south of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Kind of smack dab in the middle. Yeah. So as we're doing this, are you snowed in or what's the story? No, let's let's not say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no. We've been actually very lucky with the weather this year. Usually there is a time when we are snowed in every year but we haven't had it you know the weather's crazy all over but thank god we haven't so mm -hmm. all right well good good um well um ready to jump in yeah oh yeah i'm let's ready do let's do it yeah okay. let's do it cool so uh as we were just talking about where you uh hail from you came up uh i understand you're a bit of a track star um mm. Yeah. Can you just talk about your, you know, youth a little bit and, and how you yeah. went through that and, and kind of moved towards singing? Interesting. Um, the singing thing I kept hidden away from my family for years. They didn't know probably until I was 21 um, that I could sing. And I just, from a young age, my mom and dad put us in a lot. They put me in gymnastics first. I was a gymnast for about 14 years. 
Um, Bella Caroli came to scout me for a minute. Um, that didn't work because my body started to change. And then I became, um, uh, I wanted to do track. So I ran track. I started doing that when I was a kid around eight, but I was, I was traveling all over the world doing like, what is, I think it's the, um, the junior Olympic track meets and stuff like that. They had the Hershey one. I was doing that every year. So I literally thought I was going to the Olympics. You couldn't tell me anything else, but honestly, deep down inside for me, I always knew I wanted to be some kind of artist. I wanted to create, I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to perform in some way. So I always had it hidden from all my family. Like nobody knew. Um, That's what I wanted to do. Um, And it took, you know, really 18 years later, you know, for them to really be like, wait, what? you never sang around us. You never sang around the house. You never. And then I moved to Portland, Oregon um, on a track scholarship. I'm telling you the story fast because there's so much. Um, and then a, a teammate of mine was like, have you heard of karaoke? I grew up in church. I was kind of sheltered. I didn't really know. I didn't know what karaoke was. So I went and he's like, you know, it's this place where you can sing. You can choose your songs. It's a bar. Baby, when I discovered that, it was over. I mean, I guess I should say it opened the door to a dream I had probably manifested in my mind. I was a child that I wanted to sing and perform. And I would go to these karaoke competitions and go there from sunup to sundown five days a week. I would get dressed up. I mean, the whole nine competitions. Um, Yeah. And I, and that, and that's really how it kind of started. You know, I was always a writer. I always wrote a lot. Um, And then I just started to build when I was in Portland. I mean, when I tell you from, from the ground up grassroots, I really started this thing grassroots for sure. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. What, what was your main event in track? Um, I was a heptathlete, so I did all seven events. Wow. I did all seven, but I mainly people had knew me for the hundred, two hundred, yeah, hundred, two hundred. I hated the four hundred. Hated anything long distance to get me out of there. Um, but but in shot put, and I did shot put really well. I was a really good shot putter. Did you ever think maybe I'll train for Olympics or anything like that? Oh, or? absolutely. I mean, I knew. Um, I was training for that. So I already kind of had a trajectory uh, towards that, whether that was gymnastics or whether that was track. I just knew, I'm telling you, I was going to be in the Olympics in some way, um, but that didn't happen. (laughs) That did not go down. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and to what extent was there music in your family? Um. My father was always playing music around the house. Um, I grew up with a lot of gospel. Um, It's so funny because I was thinking about this a lot. Somebody asked me this question because how did my ears become so exposed? Play violin early. But then the gospel, of course, growing up in church, um, hearing the Clark sisters and like Patti Smith and like have my parents listen to that. But um, I think it was also in training when I was in gymnastics, too. Um, hearing classic rock radio when I was practicing, to be quite honest, um, and hearing the radio a lot and us uh, practicing to, I think it was the, it was the Rain Man soundtrack. When I first heard um, Etta James, I was like, oh my God, like it just did something to my whole body, my whole heart. I instantly was running to find out who that was. Um, just different sounds like that, you know, a little bit of jazz here. I kind of discovered that later on when I was in Portland, like I just kind of dived into it when I got to Portland. Well, I'm thinking Portland in general, just, you know, the environment there must've been quite a change for you. It was huge. It was a huge change. I mean, the rain, of course, (laughs) but, um, but people in Portland really embraced me, um, People really, really took the time to nurture me musically. You know, I had like um, mentors like Linda Hornbuckle and like, um, my God, uh, who else? Um, Andy Stokes. Like I had a lot of people take me under their wing because I was just so hungry to learn, learn. I really wanted to just soak myself into it, immerse myself in the music 24-7, 
you know, I knew of the artists, like, you know, Donnie Hathaway, I knew, of, I already knew of these artists. Um, but I just, man, when I got to Portland, it just, everything exploded for me, really, truly. To what extent did that competitive spirit uh, carry you in, in terms of music, you know? I mean, I'm thinking that probably made it where when you got up there, you wanted to kill it. Yeah, I mean, I guess the competitive sphere more w- wanting to survive because my parents were like, "We, you going up to school and you got a scholarship and you leaving, you're leaving school to go do what? To go sing at, at some jazz clubs, to go sing at your, like, <laughs> so I think it was more the competitiveness in me to survive, the competitiveness in, in me saying, um, this is something that I'm extremely passionate about, the music. Um, I know this inside of me, but everybody else couldn't understand it because I never did it around anybody at home. I mean, just imagine somebody, you know, you, I don't know, coming home and, you know, you've got this new skill <laughs> and you're good at it. And you're like, wait, but you've never did this around us growing up. You know, Not a one note, you know, so um, I just wanted to survive. I wanted to let people know that I've probably been harboring this talent in for so long that I actually feel like I do have a skill and I, and I can do it. You know what I mean? That maybe that's what kind of kept me alive in the music business in general, really. Well, how long did it take for you to feel, you know, comfortable in front of people doing that? Oh, it took me a minute. Um, I remember Linda Hornbuckle. I was going to the, it's called the candlelight, uh, candlelight room in Portland. It's a jet as a blues club. And Linda would bring me up on stage and I would sing with my back to the audience. And she was like, baby, now, you know, you like you can't be up here singing with your back to the audience. Like and every week, I'm telling you, every week I would go and then slowly I would start looking towards the audience and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it was crazy. It was really crazy. <laughs> but we, we yeah, I, I, I finally got there at some point (laughs) but she kept I mean again I had people in Portland just really pushing me you know to just get up there girl saying you know (laughs) so you mentioned Etta James but who are a couple of others that were like you know early on real favorites of yours and inspirations that we would know Whitney was a Whitney was the all-time I think for me um and then when I start to get really into it, um, like Nat King Cole, Etta James, Sade, Tina Turner, for sure, late, like latter towards the end, not really towards the end, but at my age now, like the last 10 years, I think like Tina Turner, um, who else? Um, not, there's not a lot that I, Betty Wright, um, a lot of those were the ones I was like, oh, had my ears on heavily. You know, but Etta James was the one that really kind of stirred me. She really stirred my soul. I like how she can go from just really sweet, but really rough. You know, I love that about her. <clears throat> yeah. She's mm-hmm. a legend. Yeah. 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 Um, and um, who was somebody that maybe you actually saw perform early on that you were like impressed with? Uh um wow great question um I guess I could go all the way to when I was eight with probably my parents maybe the catalyst was Diana Ross (laughs) they they sat me in front of the tv to kind of keep me quiet and I guess I was obsessed with all the clothes changes and like her fabulousness um Diana Ross but um James Brown, Chuck Berry, for sure. Um, those are the ones I definitely do remember. James, James Brown, because I think my dad would have some videos and stuff like that. I'd be watching like, oh, my God, like the performance aspect was insanity. Um, so I'd get a little bit of that. Miss mm-hmm. Ross, like the original diva. The original diva. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So what was uh, the first time that you actually sang, you know, something in front of people that wasn't karaoke and. Um, let's see one time I did one time, um, in high school, I went to a Catholic school. Um, I wanted to bring a gospel element to mass. And so, um, I told them I can write a gospel song for y'all. And they let me put this, like, I mean, out of the blue, I can't believe they let me do that. Like put together this like eight piece gospel group. I wrote a song. We performed it during mass. I told my mom, I was like, you just got to show up to mass one day. She was like, why? You know, I was like, just show up. You should show up. And she got there and she's kind of like, wait, what? That's the first time. The first time I think she saw like any inkling of anything. And even then she was probably like, this is a fluke. You know, she had help. Like, this is what's going on. Um, And then the very first time and the second time, I think when I moved to Portland, when I moved to Portland in, in the karaoke bar, when I, I remember that, I remember I saying, I will always love you. And that was a very first, that was the very first time. Um, again, my back to everybody petrified is I don't know what, but I think it just cracked open. It just cracked open the fears that I had of like, okay, you can, you can do this. I mean, for so long back then it was like oh you want to be a singer entertainer like that is not a career and it wasn't so much for me about that it was just more the creative aspect of it like I'm a creator like it's I'm like mom it's your fault (laughs) I'm a creator you know you um you put us in a lot of things you put me in a lot of things and that's just how my brain works like I'm constantly writing or constantly coming up with ideas or and stuff like that so I mean, that's what I wanted for my life. And it was kind of hard um, for them to understand that that's kind of what I want to do, you know, but they, they got over it. Now they are, <laughs> well, <that's laughs> but they, <good>. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, what, tr- what transpired uh, from, you know, getting into Portland and, and doing karaoke and, and, and feeling out your singing um, ambitions uh-huh. and, and, and your first album? um that that took a lot that was that took a lot for me um I think that's probably the most vulnerable and I miss that that I will ever be and there's something to the beauty of that because I was really um really a uh what's the word really naive but in a beautiful way um didn't know anything about the business the only thing I cared about was putting these songs out that I've created and I've created these relationships with all these amazing musical friends in Portland and the album was amazing, but I also knew nothing about the business and I learned some very valuable lessons and, um, but there's just a beauty in the naivete of what I did and that first album called embrace me. Um, and I wrote my, butt off I think (laughs) uh just as far as as being vulnerable like really being true to myself like I feel like that's that's the place even now I feel like I want to get back to was I really didn't not necessarily care is the right word I just didn't have all these things that I know about the industry and shit like that floating around in my head you know what I mean so um yeah (laughs) well so it's 2006 um Mm -hmm. and how long did it take to put that together? Was it like a year in the making or? Um, it went by fast. No, the songs I had had for a long time, like I had had a band, um, Sean Foot, um, man, so other people, uh, Sean and Joey Porter. There was a lot of people around during that time. So if I can't think of all the names, I'm sorry. Um, but it it came quick because the songs I had written, I wrote those songs a while ago. And then, um, I had my band. I also Sadell Jones. I was working with an amazing producer in Portland. Um, that was my man. That was my writing partner at the time. Um, it came quick. It came really fast. Dave Whipple. I wrote one of my best songs. I decided, um, with him, um, time with him. A lot of songs I wrote on that record with Dave, 
but it came, it came fast, maybe like six months. It came quick. How did mm. uh, old veterans like uh, Bernard Purdy and Eddie Martinez mm. get hooked into that? Oh, God. Okay, so I met Bernard Purdy. He used to come into uh, this club in Portland, uh, Jimmy Max. He would play there all the time. And then what they all told me the story, like I would watch him play. I was like, oh, my God, please play with Donny Hathaway and many more. And I asked him, I was like, because, you know, I need to have that shuffle on this first song. And he came through to the studio, blessed me. At the time, again, I'm not understanding. I understood and under- understand who he is, but just not knowing. Um, Bernard Purdy lived, you know, um, and Eddie Martinez. Oh, yes, like, but that's the thing. It's like Portland was the place that, these men who are like superheroes, you're around them all the time, but they were just so cool, you know? Like Portland just had that kind of energy. Like Eddie Martinez, I love Eddie Martinez. Like, but he was just like my brother, you know? And, and you know, I've got him on the record and playing and seeing these guys all the time, like at Candlelight Room or Jimmy Max, you know, that's, how the community was in Portland. We just will always run into each other like family, you know? So yeah, wow. it was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> very, very impressive to have them on there and, and, and such a solid, strong record, you know, I mean, Thank very, you. very consistently good throughout. And Thank you, know, you. Did, did you kind of have a sense of what you were going for in terms of like the style or vibe, you know, were you thinking like Neo soul or were you thinking um, classic soul or, I was, I was, I was just wanting to write, right? I didn't, that's what I was saying. I I didn't have anything in mind. I just wanted to write good music. Anything that my heart desired that I felt like sounded really good. And that spoke the DNA of who I was. That's what was important to me because even now to this day, I don't never feel like I wanted to get caught into a sound or, you know, then neo soul, you know, sound or soul, R&B, whatever. I just didn't want to get caught into something. I just wanted it to be a sound that spoke of who I am, you know, and coming into this business. Again, I was super naive, but that was kind of the blessing about it because I, I came in with like, what is your soul saying? What are you trying to say? what what's what are the journeys that you are talking about because you know for the most part i was always i do write about um personal shit that's happened to me you know i have to sing this on stage <laughs> i'm not i'm not about to you know these are these are real feelings these are real um emotions for me you know and they have to mean something for me when i sing them on and off stage you know they always have to come from a place for me. Like, I just don't feel like I wanted to just be writing something just to write something to, to put out there. That's never been me, really. They always have something. There's a meaning behind all of it, you know. Yeah, well, that helps, you know, brings out more conviction in the performance. Did you get much of a chance to perform this material from the first album for people? Yeah, that's such a great question. Because no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't get to get to perform this album as much as I wanted to. I did in certain spots when I was just getting out there. I decided it got on Billboard charts, crazy. Um, and after that, it just it never. I never did, which is crazy. And I and I'm working on that to do that. So. Hmm. Um. How, how did you feel about how it turned out, though? You know, were you very satisfied with it, or do you feel like, oh, I wish I would have done this different? Or how'd you feel about it? Um, I was super satisfied because of the insane, crazy musicians that were hired to play on that album. But I was also a little um, heartbroken because I didn't get to play the songs of the with the people I wrote the songs with, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So um, 
it, it, it it's a, it's just kind of a it's a twofold feeling you know for me because the album sounds amazing it sounded incredible um but the people who wrote it i didn't get a chance to actually get in the studio with the actual musicians i played with them on stage like it's a, a band family to play with them to do the record on that was the thing i think that kind of breaks my heart to this day a little bit you know mm. but the album is amazing <laughs> it is truly yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so Liv, what transpired you know from uh after that mm -hmm. to somehow crossing paths or meeting prince or however that happened uh, um so I, at the time, was about to be finished. I got my time's worth out of this is what it feels like to be an artist. I'm cool on this because it's a lot of schemey stuff going on. I don't think my heart is ready for. And um, it was my last show in Atlanta. Excuse me. Um, Marva King was at the show. And I didn't know who this woman was. I just was like, immediately, she looked different. Her, the way she walked was different. She was, I mean, everything about her. Yes, Marva King has entered the building. Um, and we were going, going back to the hotel and my management at the time, Rick, had called me on the phone and Marva, I think, I don't know, she was on three-way. Anyway, they were like, Prince is, um, would you want to, would you want to sing background for Prince? I was like, huh? Uh, and he was like, you, you remember Marva? She was at your gig in Atlanta. And I was like, yeah, but and I, in my mind, I was like, oh yeah, now it makes sense. You know, Marva, like she just, 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 it was a different aura about her period. Um, and I was like, I don't have the skill set. You know, I don't, I can sing, but I don't, you know, I don't, I've sang backgrounds with people before. Not like that, but like, Nah, I'm not the one for the gig. Thank you anyway. Um, so unbeknownst to me, they sent the video anyway um, to Prince. And I think I heard back from Marva and and them three months later. Um, and they were like, uh, Prince really loves your voice. <laughs> um, you might get a call from him. And I was in Arizona at the time. And I was telling people this, getting my hair done, getting a full weave sitting in the hair chair and they're like, Prince is going to call you from an unknown number. His assistant's going to call you. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, what's going on? Get the call. Um, and then he's just like, Hey, Liv. And I'm like, yeah, you know, um, he's like, I love your voice. We're gonna, I'm going to be in LA. You want to go somewhere warm now? I was like, Oh my God, this is, <laughs> I don't, I mean, Prince on the phone you know I had to like wrap my mind around that for a second and then after that I couldn't go but eventually then I met him at Paisley Park and then I auditioned I remember sitting at that hotel at Chanhassen Suites baby for like 15 20 hours it felt like I was like when is this gonna happen like I've been there all day um we didn't meet until later on that evening I remember going home before I went to paisley i man printed off so many so many songs that i had to learn like i mean i was at the house with like a book like a stack um because i knew his hits and stuff like that um i wasn't really supposed to listen to any of the other music <laughs> uh being in a church house so we weren't supposed to listen to any of that but i knew some of the songs and i just was tripping anyway i got to paisley I finally got there. I think it's about, I want to say seven, seven o'clock. Um, he came to the front door and I just remember him just smiling and I'm walking down the hallway, you know, the hallway with all of the, um, with like Larry Graham and like the timeline down that hallway. And he just was like, are you hungry? And I'm like, mm -mm, no, I'm not hungry. <laughs> just tell me just where I got to go sing. You know what I mean? Like, who do I, you know, like, you don't even have to talk to me. It's all good. <laughs> um, and he was like, no, relax, just chill out. Let's just get you some food. Let's talk. And then like, he was just, I love that about him. Cause he just was welcoming. Like, let me know you first. 
you know, who are you? What's your name? They call you Liv. He's like, no, what's your name? I'm like, Olivia. He's like, oh, my aunt's name was Olivia. I was like, okay. And then, um, yeah, we had a good time. We laughed. I um, mean, he asked me, he's like, do you play any other instruments? And I was like, oh, child, no. <laughs> um, no, I just, right now I'm just singing in that. I remember he threw that tamarind in my hand. Whew. I was like, oh God, I gotta be singing and playing this tamarind at the same time. God. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling on some other stuff, but, <laughs> um, but we got there to the piano room. I saw Shelby in there. Um, let's see, Marva was there. And I was so scared. I was so nervous. You can tell I was like shaking like a leaf, child. And got to the piano and he started playing. The moment he sat down and he started playing, it was like almost like a wash of I just <laughs> just print that Prince effects, that that purple effect. It was like a wash of like feel good. Like I instantly I was like transform transfixed like all right i'm good like only he can do you know only he can make you feel that way and he was like and then we started singing i think we started singing some sly and the family stones songs and stuff and if i remember there were some parts off of lotus flower um we were in the studio and we started um singing i definitely know he wanted to see if just to hear our blend if we can blend well together I mean, I know he was checking for that, but he was like, you know, we like you and can you come and do the first show with us? I think it was, they had some rooftop show in New York and I was like, I can't do it. I got a gig. <laughs> and he was like, it's okay. It's okay. And then after that, and I went back to LA and my first shows were the Nokia when he did the three nights at Nokia, um, in, the, piano, in, the piano show and in LA. Yeah. I was there. Oh, yeah. Were you? Oh, okay. I was there. Oh, whew. that was I, the day I was like the tambourine and do all these moves and sing. Oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't know that was your first show. Wow. Yeah. Because um, I'm from L.A. So, OK. Um, yeah, I was at the um, MPG Club rehearsal before. Yeah. At the show at the after show at the House of Blues. Mm -hmm. um, it was like one of the most amazing days ever. My wife and, and I. Okay. Oh man, that was something else for me. That was amazing. That's when I knew this is a different world here. This is like no other. This yeah, is, I'm sure that must have tested your stamina too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I just feel like I remember that day and then Shelby was, um, it was my first time singing background in a live music setting with Shelby and I was like oh god I gotta keep up Woo, we're gonna keep up <laughs> you know and then you know have you know memorizing the words the songs and all of that stuff like I just I just wanted to do really good you know I really wanted to be like I got this I got you you know so and I made it <laughs> I made it wow yeah that was among my favorite like sets and shows that he did throughout his whole career I mean I really like oh that wow one. Because, yes. um, yeah, I felt like he came to a whole new thing with the Rainbow Children and then, um, mm -hmm. you know, that One Night Alone stuff and, yeah, um, and uh, continued on through, um, you know, like you said, Lotus Flower and, and that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so it was like 2008 when you first met him, or what year would that be? I think it was 2009. It was like on the cusp, right? It was like 2008, 2009 is when I was really officially you know, part of the band, but 2000, I, yeah, I was right in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. So now you said you were like performing and touring, you played Atlanta and, and like that. So yeah. what were you, what were you doing though? What band were you in and, and what type of stuff were you doing? I was doing my original stuff. I was doing my music and um, I, they would have bands hired, put together bands when we would go to Atlanta and do these shows and stuff. And I was touring with the, my record with Embrace Me at the time. Um, I was trying to pick up shows here and there and it was, it was just too, it was getting too tough. It was getting, getting too hard on me. Cause I just didn't know how, like, how the hell am I supposed to sustain this? You know, like, I'm not, this ain't for me. You know, I tried it. <laughs> I did everything that I could. I tried it. I gave it a really good go and I was done. Like, I would, I wouldn't say I was done musically, but I was just done. 
I felt with the process and I'm like, I sure, no problem. I can sing from time to time, different places. I just really was done really. <laughs> so how, how much, um, you know, direction was, did Prince give you? In what way? In, like, in, like, like in what he wanted um, vocally or, you know, in um, maybe arranging the vocals or anything Oh, like he that? gave us direction. He knew, he always knew what he wanted from us. Um, he knew um, me, Shelby, and Elisa's voices were a beautiful blend. Different styles, definitely different styles, but the blend was beautiful. And um, it was amazing for me just really is a taking it all in to see how his mind was working on how he'd be like, okay, you guys are just so use these, you know, stock harmonies, you know? And then I was I like, yeah, you know, in my mind, like, okay, we know exactly the harmonies to go to, but like listening to where he would put vocally, he would put notes or he would sustain the note or he would just, you know, I was learning in that way. I was picking up from him musically how he would arrange vocals and how he would, you know, his style stylistically. That's what I was getting from him. You know, again, I mean, for me, I was a kid in candy store. I was soaking it up. Like I was like a child. My eyes were big, like every day, every rehearsal day, you know, and even when we would be sitting out in the lobby with him and his guitar and us girls, I'm talking about hours upon hours upon hours upon hours we would be singing. This isn't like two hours. We would be singing for about eight hours every day at Paisley Park. And um, some people probably couldn't even take that. You know, we, we just wanted it to be perfect. We wanted it to sound like how he was hearing it in his head, you know, and we were also his sisters too, in a way that, you know, if you needed for us to catch you vocally or anything like that, we, you know, we got you. Turn around, you look, we got you, you know. And I had to learn that from, from Shelby, just watching him and Shelby's relationship, you know. Um, and even Elisa, because they've known him and been there before me. So I'm, again, I'm just taking this all in and looking at this new world I've got myself into, <laughs> um, you know, watching more. It's like, I, honestly, I was picking up everything. I was listening to everything everything soaking it up as much as I could and I always he'd be like live you know I don't hear you <laughs> you know or like you know don't be flat you know what I mean you over there sounding <laughs> um but he would do it in such a loving way you know he'd be playing with us and um joking around and that's what I loved about it because it was it, for me it was a family, it's a family environment, it was family, a lot of it was, you know, and I'm learning from my brother, I'm learning everything from my brother, like, him bringing, even him bringing music to me, and, like, me understanding about, you know, like, Mother's Finest, and, like, different artists he was bringing it to me, like, even new artists, not just the ones in the past, but ones he would find out about, he would bring it to us, too, it's amazing, amazing. How, how did your parents feel about that once they knew that you had... You know, because oh, baby, they was like, she got it. <laughs> she got it. <laughs> did they understand? Did, 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 did they understand at that point that, that Prince wasn't just, you know, the like crazy sex crazed performer he was in his early days? That he was, oh, much more no, than that? They, they knew way before then. I think they were just, they are probably still in shock. They were just like, what is going on? Okay, like you have, you must have something, you know, you're still, you're still hanging on. So. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a sort of a type, at least one type among all these associates that Prince has had, you know, and, and a lot of MPG members have come from, you know, uh, backgrounds where they had a strong church upbringing and maybe uh, some choir, you know, activities and, weren't that up on, you know, mainstream music growing up and, and, and also don't seem like they're starstruck by him so much, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and just accept him on a personal human level. Yeah, truly. I mean, 
that's the thing for me. I mean, of course, I was starstruck, but mine was different. Mine was more like the master teacher, man. Like, this is, you know, um, I, again, like, I'm here to learn. Like, I know who you are. You know what I mean? I know, I know who you are. You know, it was just, I was going to school every day, every day, you know, with him. At two, you know, the two, three, four, or five o'clock in the morning school too. <laughs> Be ready to sing at a drop of a dime, <laughs> you know. And um, I, yeah, that that's what I loved about, and I loved that he loved to push us. You know, I love he was always ready just to push the limits all the time. That was what I I thrived for. I was like addicted to that. Like, let's go. What you want to do? You know, <laughs> let's get it, you know. Was that kind of like shades of when you had a track coach? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. That's probably why I love it so much because he was always going, 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 going. And I'm like, man, like, it, it, I'm kind of like even that way now with my band. Like, you know, I want us to all be at our best. You know what I mean? Like, if you're going to play, like, let's play. Let's get it, you know. Um, I'm just super passionate, super passionate about any time I step on the stage. And I felt like he was the same, you know, any stage, any time, any place, you know, it's going to come out. When was the first time you got to go in the studio with him when something was being worked on? Um, the first time when I met him, that was the first time. Uh, that was the very first time. Um, but uh, Lotus Flower, when we were working on that, I want to say maybe it was Future Soul Song. I could be wrong. I just remember like, oh, this is interesting. All of us are on one mic. You know, um, just the different techniques and stuff. Uh, how the girls, all of us would be on one mic and he would position us in different ways. Whose voice was a little bit stronger on this song and the timber, you know, working on a timber of each other's voices and tones and stuff. Um, I do remember that. Yeah, it was, it was definitely Lotus flower. I think, I think it, I want to say it was future soul, soul song. And I remember that day Prince was having, he was holding out a note, honey. And he was looking at me, he said, Shelby, he was like, he he said, see like this. And maybe he, it was like some falsetto, but he was like holding it for damn near like 40 seconds. And me and Shelly and Lisa, we all started laughing. We was like, okay. <laughs> you just, I mean, effortlessly. And I was like, we, hey, I mean, you got it. <laughs> he was laughing, laughing at us. You know, we always have fun with him like that. But, um, but we have fun in the studio. We had a, lot, a good time in the studio. We worked fast. Girls and I worked fast. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he liked or demanded that because he notoriously is so fast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was. Yeah. I, I mean, I learned that quickly. Like, that's what I'm saying when I learned with working with him. Like, you just have to be quick. You know, you have to be really quick. You have to be really sharp. Think on your feet sharp. You know, I, I'm the kind of person I like taking a little time. You know, they were like, mm mm you know, be on it. And that's why, you know, I kind of liked being on edge a little bit around because it kept me on my toes. It kept my mind, you know, he would always be like, okay, somebody got to take some ginkgo biloba around here. <laughs> so, yeah. And did you uh, move to that area or you stayed? No, 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 no. I stayed, I stayed in Portland. I stayed in Portland, but we would be gone for weeks, weeks at a time. And come to and, uh, our good old country and his suites, our second home. <laughs> and, and you got to uh, travel overseas for performing, or oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I yeah, I feel super super blessed, super super blessed. He blessed us in that way. I shouldn't be saying for us, but for me, he blessed me just to be able to see the world like that, a different perspective, you know, musically. Um, you know, musically, just how people are, just he blessed me with the experience of that. Really did. 
Are there one or two just really super unforgettable um, stage experiences with Prince that you could just share that come to mind? Wow, man. Um, Essence. When he, for me, when he played Purple Rain, it was something about how that moved, that, that room moved. It was something about the energy in him that he gave. I don't know. He always gave it. It was just something, something else was coming off of him. This is like spiritual. That had us in tears, had me in tears. Um, and I think there's another time. I think it was in London. I want to say farm something. It was a uh, festival. I don't know. That festival was killing. <laughs> it's so, it's so many of them. It's hard for me. So many, it's hard for me to narrow down because each one of those were like super, super special. You know what I mean? Um, it's it's hard because there's so there's so many. <laughs> I, I again, I was just probably too. I had to pay attention to what I was doing, but I was like really watching him, like make sure I I got to snap out of it, you know? Because he's just doing some amazing things on that stage, man. Like. Even like with Third Eye Girl, like to get a chance to see him play, play, like play guitar, and, like see him pick, um, play bass, even at um at, at the forum, like those shows. I mean, even talking about him now, you know, life is fleeting, it comes so fast, you know. And I just realized if I just had more eye time and just whew, be in the moment more, more of it. You know? Yeah. Um, was there a part of the show? Uh, first, uh, how many um, tours did you participate in? Oh. Um, Lotus Flower, Welcome to America, some hit and run with Third Eye Girl. So maybe three. If I'm not missing one. I was in and out with third eye girl for the hit and run thing yeah so lotus flower welcome to america and um yeah so for those was there a um, particular point in one of those shows uh where you got a spotlight you know where where you felt like you were the most you know out there no i i think he he never had to do that with us um He'd be like, here's a mic, go up there and sing, when will we, when will we be paid? And I'm like, you know, on panic mode. Um, he never had to do that. And I think the first, I do remember the first time I did that in the Lotus Flower Tour. I just, I was so cool with just being like, do whopping in the back. I'm so cool with that. But I also think that he was training me in a way of like, man, step up, you know? Go out there, you know, you got it. <laughs> um, and he never had to, man. You know, so many people that I, I just know there's so many people that are so much more deserving, in my opinion, of, of being up there at, at that point where I felt like, man, you over here, like really walking me through this, you know, and he saw something I couldn't even really see in myself at the time. And as I started to perform more and do the, um, Welcome to American tours and stuff like that with them. You see my personality starting to come out more because he would give us spotlights to sing a couple of songs, not a couple, like more so I should say at the after shows. You know, I would say that like the after shows, he let us really kind of go, you know. So I, I really appreciate when he gave us that. He never had to do that. Never give us that light like that, you know. Yeah. So that tour was the last one I got to see him actually because you know I as I told you I lived in Los Angeles most of my life so I got to see him a okay. lot. But then okay. I moved to, moved, moved to Charlotte, and okay. he didn't come here very often. Okay. So the Welcome to America was like the last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. Were you gratified when they put that out last year? I was. Finally, yeah. I was. I, I had no lie. I kind of forgot a little bit about some of the stuff we reported. Um, there was just some, just some powerful messages and stuff going on 
with him at that time. I mean, I just I remember a, around Paisley, just his energy was just, um, he just had a lot on his mind. He needed to get out, you know, you could tell me because it was coming, it was pouring out of him, you know, lyrics and stuff like that and coming into the studio and yeah, but it was a lot, it was a lot. Mm-hmm. It actually was better than I expected it to be. I mean, I liked it more, and I, I think it's better than I expected it to be. Yeah. You know, uh-huh. I, I really uh-huh. like it, um, yeah. that album, yeah. And, yeah. of course, the live show is off the chain, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Especially yeah. the part uh, where he, you know, does um, the soloing and play the funky music and the bass, like That's you right. said. Oh, yes. Man. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, I don't watch that for We could do this for hours and hours. Goose bumps and, hours. and chills, you know, again. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Man. How was the vibe different to you with the Third Eye Girl? Because that was really interesting, you know, when he made that shift. Mm-hmm. I I loved it. It was a different kind of energy. It was like, it was definitely rock. I was so geeked um, because I had already, when he started playing, uh, X's face, stare. I was like, ooh, <laughs> he is about to snap. You know what I mean? And I think for me as a fan, in a way of looking back at him just as a fan, like I love him playing guitar, like just watching him. That's where I'm just like, <laughs> um, I'm that person that's on the side, like googly eyes. And um, I just, just the energy and like, and like seeing Donna and like Ida, like I was excited. I was excited for them on that. I mean, it's a shift. I mean, he's always, that's the thing about him. He was, he's always shifting, you know, he's always changing his sound, flowing out what he feels like he wants to. And I was just like, oh, this is going to be, oh, this is hard. Um, So I love, I loved it. I, I loved it really. Super loved it. Those are definitely two of my favorite uh, hit and run tracks you just named for sure. Oh, really? Oh, oh man. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Love when he takes it to those places. That's um, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What was your favorite one or two tracks to perform on stage? Uh, Prince tracks. Oh, uh, how can you do this to me? Adore. Um, little red Corvette. Um, Dreamer. Those now are my those, top. Is that just because you like those songs too much, or you just enjoyed performing those a lot? Both. Dreamer, Dreamer is the one that got me. I was like, <laughs> just it's just something about. Um, man, his conviction when playing that live. Yeah, when he when he did that on Leno, um, was it? Oh yeah, was it Leno? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Whoa, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's off the TV, you know. When you get that surround sound, and then it, and then there's clearly a couple times, you know, we be we were in rehearsal mode, and then like, man, we go there. Those are the times that I wish I can rewind back in my mind, like in B- NPG Music Club. Whew. I mean, the times that I got, even to like him, him, that one last time we were there and him and Mono Neon and Donna. <laughs> Just, I was like, oh man, I mean, for about, eight minutes you know i mean it's also those times that i can only just keep a photographic memory and just memory in my mind and that's okay because it's the nostalgia and the feeling of like oh my god not just the performance times but the time when we were rehearsing yeah. we went there you know it was incredible really yeah People know Prince know that some of the best, as exquisite and amazing as all the stuff that most people have heard is, 
lot of the rehearsal stuff is as good or better, you know? My, my, my. Yeah. Some amazing stuff. Yeah. I keep hoping that maybe we'll see some form of release for some of the stuff he did with mono, you know, right mm. in the end, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I've seen, I've seen stuff, you know, but I'm hoping they'll release some stuff. Yeah. I, I understand that. Yeah. Cause being in that room, get the ugly face quick. <laughs> Cause it was next level, next yeah. level. Mm-hmm. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinslift.net. Thank you very much.